my father is about to eat this packet of pepper straight up. It's based on a dare. So images of a garden and a land to be cultivated are ripe throughout the scriptures. It's a metaphor that was used a lot in the Old and New Testament. I mean, think about it for a moment. We'll just look at a few. The book of Genesis introduces the right relationship between humankind and God in the Garden of Eden. That's Genesis 2, 4 through 3, 24. And we know that didn't end ideally, but it portrays this perfect utopian existence between God and humankind. Jesus often used metaphors in comparing the ways of the kingdom of God with gardens and agricultural land cultivation. This was the culture that Jesus was in 2,000 years ago as well. Lots of people were farming. That was a big part of their economy. You look at John 15, 1 through 8. You look at Matthew 20, 1 through 16. You look at Matthew 21, 33 through 46, just to give some examples. It struck me as I was thinking about all this stuff and as I was trying to hack through the weeds in my own garden and my front yard, that there's a helpful gardening metaphor in regard to the spiritual gifts that are presented in Ephesians 4, 7 through 13. If you don't know me, you got to know that I love Ephesians 4, 7 through 13. I've done extensive deep dives into this section of scripture. I've read lots of teaching about it, lots of thought about it. There are a lot of great thinkers like that are part of the missional conversation that have talked about this gifting in Ephesians 4, 7 through 13. If you're not familiar with it, it's the apest gifting, apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. We live in this clergy, laity sort of culture in America and in the West in general. <laughs> and it's driven by consumerism. It's driven by individualism. We think we need to present ourselves in a certain way. We think <clears throat> the more that like we prop certain giftings up and get people to consume them, and the more we appeal to people's individual needs, the better we're going to do at creating the kingdom of God. But really what we create is a whole lot of consumerism and individualism, right? And the New Testament speaks very contrary to this sort of consumer, individual, clergy, laity divide that exists. Like, just look at Ephesians 4, 7 through 13. It says this. Now, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. For it says, when he ascended on high... He took the captives captive. He gave gifts to people. But what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? Weird verse there. Like, it's talking about like, hey, like he also, he ascended to heaven. Jesus ascended to heaven, but he also like took on hell and sin and death, right? The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things. Like he came, he was fully God, fully man, tempted in every way, but rose from the dead. And he himself gave some to be apostles. That's where we get to the key text here. Some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ. So all those five giftings, wirings, are used to build up the body of Christ in the work of ministry until we all reach unity in the faith. It's going to bring about unity to press into these five gifts. And in the knowledge of God's son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. The fullness of Christ exists in this fivefold gifting. And it's revealed within Christ's people that are called his. Like the big point here is we're called to be disciple makers. Now this group 3DM, I love 3D movements, 3dmovements.com. You can look them up has done some great work in creating a disciple-making culture and it utilizes all people in their gifting and they point out some great things about understanding APES gifting and culture. I'd recommend that you look at their website, that you take a look at what they've got. They got some great blogs, great podcasts about this. Great work in this area. Alan Hirsch has written a great book about this called The Forgotten Ways. I mean, it's a pretty large volume, but it's very helpful if you're interested in digging further. But we're going to look at how the apest functions in the garden of God, okay? So we got to understand something here. We're going to look at all five of these giftings in Ephesians 4. We're looking at Ephesians 4.11 particularly and how they function in the garden of God. I want you to imagine for a moment that God's kingdom, like the church 
and the culture and God's world in a sense and the church within the world are like a garden. And all these five giftings are different giftings that contribute to the health of that garden. I'm gonna play with that metaphor for a moment here. Check it out. Like, number one, we've got apostles. You gotta know apostles are like entrepreneurs. They are the innovators. They are the pioneers. They're the ones that start new things. Like the word apostle means missionary, essentially. It means a sent one, somebody that goes and starts new things. Like apostolic people are passionate about starting new things. And in the garden of God's kingdom, apostles are like jackhammers. They are like, um, you know, excavators. Like they are like shovels. Like they literally look at a slab of concrete and they go, look, man, that's gonna be a garden someday. I am going to hammer through that concrete and I am going to dig out all the rocks and I am going to till the soil. I'm going to get the, all the clay out, get all the junk out, get all the garbage out of there so that this can be soil to be cultivated. And like they'll say that and other people will be like, yeah, right. It'll never happen. But apostles will be like, man, I can see that happening in the future. I can see that happening like apostolic leaders who are committed to the work of the kingdom. They'll set to work and they will hammer away at the rocks. They'll hammer away at the clay. They will cultivate that soil. They will work at that soil to get it healthy to the point where other people can come in and start doing the work. They will pioneer it. They'll go out first. They'll be the first to crack into that concrete, crack into that soil, crack into that clay when nobody believed it, right? And like this can have its flaws. Apostles without humility I mean, to the other parts of the body, to the prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers, they can end up being jackhammers that are aimless. Like they'll go and they will hammer away at stuff. They will try to create new things all the time and they will not be humble to others. And, and then maybe at times like it's the wrong place to do it. Maybe they shouldn't have like gone for that concrete slab because it's just like 50 feet of concrete straight down. There's no point in making a garden there, but they'll, they'll go, hey man, we're gonna keep going and going and we're gonna keep trying new things and we're gonna keep moving to the next new thing to the point where it's unhealthy and we need to lean into each other, right? Because if you lean into the other giftings, which we'll talk about more, it becomes healthier. Isaiah alluded to the apostolic leader in, uh, in Isaiah 58, 11 through 12, and he wrote this. He wrote, the Lord will always lead you, satisfy you in a parched land. Like you're gonna be the lone like pioneer and strengthen your bones. You'll be like a watered garden and like a spring whose water never runs dry. Like you it may feel like a parched land. It may, you may feel alone and in initiating something new, but the Lord will water you and like fulfill you. Some of you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will restore the foundations laid long ago. You will be called the repairer of broken walls the restorer of streets where people live. This is apostolic leadership. Like looking at things that are broken, looking at things that need restoration, looking at things that need something pioneered, something new and going, man, I see the vision of the future of what this could be. And I see that the kingdom could come alive in this place. People need Jesus here. I'm gonna help start it. God will call apostolic leaders into situations where people don't know God. We're talking areas of the city where people have rejected Jesus. You know, we're talking people groups that have rejected Jesus. We're talking areas of the world where it's really hard to follow Jesus, like Europe, you know, like where many people aren't Jesus followers, like apostolic leaders want to start works there or like tribal places where like people haven't even heard the gospel or places like in the mountains where people haven't heard. This is where apostolic people want to go. This is where the apostle Paul wanted to go. Like he wanted to go all over the Mediterranean and spread the gospel amongst the Gentile world where people hadn't heard of it. And he first went to synagogues and tried to preach that to the religious folks. Lots of them rejected him. Some followed and Gentiles like ended up coming to Christ as a result. And he went into all these wild new situations and started pioneering works like it's incredible what can happen when apostolic leaders function in the garden of God. And then let's talk about prophets. Like again, in Ephesians 4, 11, it talks about prophets being one of those gifts. Isaiah. Okay. We'll get to that in a second. In the garden of God's kingdom, prophets are like the weed killer. They are like the pruning shears, you know, they are the hedge trimmers. They're the ones that identify the issues in the garden. Like they see the weeds, they see the problems, they see the toxicity in the garden and they will kill the weeds. And then they'll see the bad branches in the healthy plants and they'll prune them off. 
right? Because they're the types that call out the status quo. Like they're not afraid to call out sin. They're just not afraid to say, hey, this is not the way we should go. God does not want us to be this way. God does not want us to do this. We need to expose it. We need to call it out. Prophets aren't afraid to like say the stuff that nobody wants to say, even when, you know, it might be everybody that isn't willing to hear it. They'll still say it because they really want to follow God in it, right? And prophetic leaders who are committed to the work of the kingdom, they'll set to work killing weeds. Like apostolic leaders might clear out that space for the soil to come in. Prophetic people will come in and go, hey, man, there's a problem here. There's hypocrisy here. There's sin here. This is not right. We're not fully obeying God here. We're not fully doing what God wants. We're not being just like God wants. We're not caring for the oppressed like God wants. You know, they will come in. They'll kill the weeds. They'll spray the weeds like they'll they'll trim. They'll be like the instrument of God's pruning in a lot of ways that will call out aspects of systems that aren't right. Aspects of individuals that need to be set right. And again, like, you know, prophets without humility to the other parts of the body will end up being brash and harsh and difficult. And they might even end up killing plants that they think are weeds. Like they might end up calling out things that don't need to be called out. They might end up pruning something to the point where it dies and they might bring death to the body with their harshness and their sort of like ability to call out the status quo, ability to call people to obedience. Like if they don't have a heart right with God and a mind right with God, they might call out the wrong things. And I mean, Isaiah actually alluded to prophetic leadership in Isaiah 58, one through eight, when he wrote this, he said, cry out loudly, don't hold back. Come on, prophet, speak up, raise your voice like a ram's horn. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. They seek me day after day and delight to know my ways like a nation that does what is right and does not abandon the justice of their God. They ask me for righteous judgments. They delight in the nearness of God. Why have we fasted and you have not seen, they say. We have denied ourselves, but you haven't noticed. Look, you do as you please on the day of your fast and oppress all your workers. You fast with contention and strife to strike viciously with your fist. You're unjust. You cannot fast as you do today, hoping to make your voice heard on high. Will the fast I choose be like this? A day for a person to deny himself, to bow his head like a reed, and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Like all this ritual doesn't mean anything, the prophet says. This is the fast I choose, is written in Isaiah, to break the chains of wickedness, to untie the ropes of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and tear off every yoke. Is this not the fast I choose? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the poor and homeless into your house, to clothe the naked when you see him and not to ignore your own flesh and blood? Then your light will appear like the dawn and your recovery will come quickly. Your righteousness will go before you and the Lord's glory will be your rear guard. Isaiah 58 talks about the prophetic gifting. Like, look, it's like Isaiah is looking at God's people and saying, listen, you're not doing what God wants. You're doing all this ritual stuff. You're doing all this religious stuff. You're doing all these things that are hypocritical. You're not following God. Follow God and get back to what he really wants. That's the prophet's call. And I mean, you got to know that God will call prophets into situations where there's going to be resistance. If you're a prophetic person, I mean, like, you're going to be called into situations with individuals and within systems and within scenarios like where there's resistance, where like people are blind to something and they're not seeing it and they need to be called to genuinely see it. Genuine obedience. They're like the consultants in the kingdom of God, right? That's the prophetic leadership. Now look at evangelistic leaders. In the garden of God's kingdom, evangelists are like basically like botanists to some degree. Like they work in like a greenhouse and they are like working in a nursery, cultivating plants, and then they transplant them into gardens. Like, so in a sense, like if the greenhouse were the culture, if the greenhouse were the world or like the world outside of the church, right? Evangelists cultivate in the greenhouse. They hang out in the culture. They hang out with people that don't follow Jesus, right? They cultivate relationship. They, they like genuinely build relationship and then they bring in people into the church and connect them with the kingdom through what the church is doing. And they come and transplant these plants after they've made connection with them. They transplant them into gardens, right? Evangelistic leaders who are committed to the work of the kingdom, they'll set to work 
doing that. They will get in as many situations as they can with people that don't know Jesus and try to connect them with relationships with others, try to connect them with the gospel, tell people about the Jesus who died for them, who forgives them, and connect them into networks of people that love Jesus so that they'll be drawn to the kingdom. Like evangelistic people will do that. And then eventually people will start coming to Christ and a variety of people may come to Christ and be drawn to the church, drawn into the body of Christ as a result. And evangelists without humility, the other parts of the body will end up just being inviters. They'll be like PR people and they'll be shallow to some degree. Like they'll just get people in the door. They won't like do the follow up. They won't do the discipleship. Like they, they won't challenge people to a deeper life or anything like that at all. They won't challenge people in obedience. They'll just be like, hey, come on, man. Let's get as many people as we can in. Let's just get people to the gospel. That's the big goal. That's all that matters. Like, we just need to get people together, a diversity of people even. But then we don't go deep, right? And again, actually, Scripture alludes to this here. The Holy Spirit was displaying Paul's evangelistic zeal for those outside the church in the greenhouses of the world in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. When Paul explained this, he said, although I am free from all and not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. Like I want to love people and make myself available to people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win Jews. In other words, I became a re- like a religious person of the time, you know, like to those under the law, like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law to win those under the law. And I'm related to them based on wh- where they're at to try to help them see Jesus. To those who are without the law, like one without the law, though I am not without God's law, but under the law of Christ to win those without the law. Like he didn't like enter the Gentile realm and the pagan world, like the Roman world and just like live however he wanted. But he connected with people where they were, befriended them, loved them, like found even ground to win people towards the kingdom. To the weak, I became weak in order to win the weak. I become all things to all people. So I made by every possible means, save some. Now I do all this because of the gospel so that I may share in its blessings. This is Paul. Like he's like passionate about the gospel. He's like, I want to see as many people come to know Jesus as I can. So I will avail myself to everybody. Like I will serve people. I will love people. I will put myself in situations, all massive variety. We see this in Paul. We see it in the book of Acts. He's in all these situations with intellectuals, rural people, like middle-class folks. Like he hangs out with everybody to try to get them to see who Jesus is. And I mean, God will call evangelists into situations where people don't follow Jesus, put point blankly. And they need that connection to the church. And then they need to be able to go out and be fishers of people and like draw people to the gospel but they need to be connected in situations where people don't follow Jesus so that they can share the gospel with people that need it and love on people that need the gospel, that need Jesus, right? And that's the evangelistic gifting. Then we look at like the shepherd gifting as we're at that part in Ephesians 4.11. In the garden of God's kingdom, shepherds, pastors, they are like the sunshine. That's a shepherd, a pastor. They are soul care people. Like, think about a garden. Like, where would a garden be without the sunshine? It's the thing that nurtures the plants. I mean, it helps them grow. Like, it causes photosynthesis. Like, it makes the plants belong. Like, plants literally lean towards the sun. If you looked at, like, a time-lapse photo, like, you know, a video of a plant and the sunshine in relation to it, you'll see plants lean towards the sun. And that's what people who are Jesus followers, who are new in their faith or who have been around for a while, they always lean towards shepherds because they receive love and mercy and compassion from shepherds in a way that provides them growth and nurture and soul care. They experience the mercy and grace of God through shepherds. Shepherds are so vital to the body of Christ. And I mean, shepherd leaders, pastoral leaders who are committed to the work of the kingdom, they'll set to work loving people in the body of Christ. That's what they're best at. They help people belong. They help people be heard. They have wonderful ears to hear people's stories. They have wonderful hearts from Christ. They have the heart of Christ in that sense to genuinely dwell with people in their pain and their brokenness and their struggles, walk with people, care for people, nurture people. And again, this can have its ups and downs without humility to the other parts of the body. Shepherd leaders, pastoral leaders can end up over 
loving people like it's possible like helping can hurt people you can help people so much you can be so available to people that it creates a codependency or that you're just serving people to the point like where you're not actually helping them anymore but they're just dependent on you right and you can love people to the point where you don't call them out on anything or like you don't actually like push them towards anything better and then they can end up you know being scorched that's like the sun overkilling the plants i remember in july like i my grass went brown because this was too much sun sunshine you know not enough rain which we'll talk about too and without humility to the other parts of the body pastoral shepherd leaders who are great at soul care can end up hurting people in the body by over loving them and check out what scripture says about shepherd leaders about a shepherding culture First Corinthians 13 talks about a shepherd in culture, one of the most beautiful passages in scripture where Paul says, if I speak human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. If I don't love people, like what good is it to even speak? If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so I may move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. And if I give away all my possessions and give over my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, not boastful, not arrogant. It's not rude, not self-seeking, not irritable, does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. This is shepherding culture. It's the shepherd heart of Jesus, you know, and God will call shepherd pastoral leader leaders into situations where people need to be loved particularly church scenarios where people who are followers of jesus need to feel like they belong are loved are heard are cared for you know are displayed patience to what a beautiful gift it's like if you had a garden without sunshine where would the garden be let's look at teachers here ephesians 4 11 also talks about teachers apostles prophets evangelists shepherds and teachers in the gardens of in the garden of god's kingdom teachers are the rain i mean they literally are the moisture that comes to nurture the soil and bring out the nutrients in the soil you know rain actually causes plants the soil underneath plants to bring out its nutrients so that the plants grow so that they end up receiving the nutrients. Like there's a pH level that's like perfect for that. Somewhere in the 60s that comes from rain to fill up those plants and make them grow. So teachers are all about instructing people in the truth of the knowledge of God to help them grow. They're about wisdom. They're about knowledge. They're about understanding the scriptures clearly, interpreting scriptures correctly, helping like with the nuance and like the tension within scripture so people see the word of God explode before their eyes. And I mean, teachers who are committed to the work of the kingdom, they'll set to work teaching, instructing, you know, guiding, like helping people have right understanding of scripture, helping people wrestle with the tensions in scripture, helping people grow in wisdom, the book of Proverbs, full of wisdom, helping people to understand and apply the word of God clearly and helpfully, right? Now, teachers without humility to the other parts of the body, though, end up becoming doctrine heads. They can end up becoming so intellectual or they can become so mind oriented that they don't think about the heart like shepherds do or they don't think about like the hard things like many prophets do or they don't think about trying to be on mission to reach people like ap apostles and evangelists do. Right. Like you can become ingrown if you're a teaching culture, like you can become so doctrine oriented that you're like the church in Ephesus in the book of Revelation who had lost their first love. Like they had rejected all this wrong teaching. Yes. But Jesus said, you lost the love you had at first. You lost your love for me, lost your love for each other, lost your love for those outside of the church. So like, I'm going to remove my lampstand unless you repent. He literally says like, stop being so doctrine minded that you like lose your way. And look at what scripture says about teachers. Here's what it says. Teachers are in this hot pursuit of the mind of God. <laughs> what a great thing to be in pursuit of. Look at what Romans 11, 33 through 36 has to say about God's infinite wisdom. We were in this recently too as a church body. and We looked at this passage. It's beautiful. It's a doxology. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor and who has ever given to God that he should be repaid. 
For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Teachers are chasing after what's in this passage. The judgments and untraceable ways. The mind of the Lord. The ways of God. And they are like, I'm going to swim in that knowledge. I am going to dive into the Bible. I am going to read commentaries and books. I am going to read like lots of different thought patterns to understand this book and help bring it to light for people that don't see it yet. And God will call teachers into situations where people need that knowledge. They need that growth. They need that rain-soaked soil that's gonna bring the nutrients of God's word into the lives of Jesus followers and make them flourish in their mind, in wisdom, in knowledge, in understanding. And then we could talk about like combinations of two or three dominant giftings. like. And again, you can take the APES test. We'll talk about that in a moment. Like, you can get there, man. Like, all you got to do is go to fivefold.3dmovements.com or go to fivefoldministry.com. Take the test right now, and you can find out how you're wired. Like, and then you'll find you might have two or three dominant giftings. Like, my wife Sarah, for example, is an evangelistic shepherd. So what she's really good at is loving people who don't follow Jesus like way before they ever do. And she's very patient with them and helps love them. And at times people end up connecting with the body of Christ as a result. At times they don't. And she's really good at meeting people right where they are when they're far from God and loving them and being understanding and being patient with them. Even when, you know, they don't understand all these things yet. She has this tremendous patience and she's got a heart for people to see and know Jesus. And she leads them through love and nurture like I have a dominant evangelistic gifting. So like, that's my main gift. Like I want to see people come to Christ. It's like my biggest thing I want to see, but then apostolic and prophetic are the next up for me. So like, I've got this whole side of me. Like I want to go to places that the gospel's not being proclaimed and like where there's not strong, like Jesus followers, where there's not strong, like Bible based kingdom based stuff going on. And I also have this prophetic side where I want to challenge the church. I want to challenge people to really follow Jesus with everything they are. And again, with all my shortcomings, those are there. So I know that's there. And I know like in the teaching and shepherding arenas, like it's not as strong. So I lean into others that are stronger in that area. And as I lean more and more in, into them, we become more strong as a whole. And I even like learn how to do some of that sometimes. So again, take the APES now. Like, find out how you're wired like and then you'll see like it'll make sense to you like man this is why i like doing this this is why i've got this function in the kingdom of god this is why like i find myself being a jackhammer this is why i find myself being you know sort of a weed killer this is why i find myself being sort of like a nursery transplanter of other plants into the kingdom like this is why i find myself like being like the sunshine or being like the rain right and to give an analogy, we have 100% of Jesus living in us, and that's spread out across the APES spectrum. So one could be like me. You know, if you took the fivefoldministry.com test, you'd find, like me, what your percent percentages are. Right now, I'm like 23% evangelist, 21% apostle, 21% prophet, 20% teacher, and 14% shepherd. The shepherd and teacher thing actually flip-flopped in the past couple of years because I pressed more in to teaching. And you know, as a result, maybe some of my soul care efforts have suffered. Now we could take this test and find out how we're wired, how where we're strong and where we're not as strong. But Jesus is our 100% apostle, 100% prophet, 100% evangelist, 100% shepherd, and 100% teacher. He's fully God, he's fully man. Here's gonna come the evangelistic side of me. He's the only one that like, can initiate Christ in us can initiate works of the kingdom like where they're not happening like nobody can he can call out the hypocrisy within Christendom and Christian religion and like he can deconstruct all the right things without deconstructing the truth like a prophet would like a perfect prophet would he Christ is the perfect evangelist he's the one that invites people genuinely to a relationship with him through the kingdom He's the perfect shepherd. He's like the carer of our soul. He's our water and our breath of life. He's the one that genuinely loves well. He's the perfect teacher. He has all wisdom, all knowledge, all truth, understands all the word of God, entirety of scripture, better than we ever could. Praise to his holy name. For grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive. He gave gifts to people. 
the one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things. May he fill us. If you want to dig deeper into this teaching, just go to the deep dive study guide. We're going to have it out at the time of this video. And again, it's called a pests in the garden of God. And we're not talking about termites in the garden of God. We're talking about the a pest, the giftings in Ephesians four, right? Check it out, man. You can read it. We did a much, much deeper dive than what I talked about here. And again, if you read it, you're probably going to retain like 20% of what you read. You'll hear 10% of what I'm saying now. And if you want to go even deeper, join a discipleship group. Do join a DNA group. We've got DNA groups available if you want to join into one of our discipleship groups or join into one in your area. If you need help finding them, we'd love to help you find one. If you're watching this from outside of Akron, Ohio area, we'd love to connect you with that. Thank you for everything you do, for everything you're part of. We want to invite you as well. You can give to our mission as well. Like the Lord has continued to give us what we need through the generosity of his people. We've been on par meeting our budget for a year and a half at the chapel in Kenmore. That's the church that this video is part of. And I'm certain as we step out in faith in the near future and far out in the future, he's going to continue to give us what we need to honor his mission. Like you got to know my heart. I got that apostolic and evangelistic thing, man. I want to see churches planted. But what I really want to see are effective neighborhood churches that are on the ground meeting people where they are and building discipleship community and mission not that are trying to become like big things but are genuinely organically on the ground building into people pouring into communities pouring help into communities bringing flourishing to communities we want to see that expand so i mean when you're giving towards our mission that's what you're giving towards you can give to kenmore.thechapel.life slash giving and give whatever you feel led to give. If you're new to what we're doing, if you're just checking us out, don't feel obligated to. But again, that's our goal is to invite everybody into a lifelong relationship with Jesus and unleash all that Christ has put in them. We want to see that apex gifting unleashed in everybody. I want to see apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers all across the city of Akron and maybe beyond that, you know, to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Like, wherever people can be unleashed fully in their gifting. That's what we want to see. We want to see our people who are part of our community unleashed in their gifting, living in maturity and humility amongst one another and being used by Christ fully. So that's one of the many things we give towards. That's part of our mission. We appreciate you being a part of our mission right now. We appreciate you checking out this video, man. Share it. Put the word out. Peace.